And welcome to Civil Discourse. I'm Jamie Wojciechowski. And I'm Marilyn Brown. And today we are discussing intersectionality and challenging racism with mindfulness. All right. So I'm going to start us off with a quote. Um, this quote is by Nina Simone. Um, today would have been her 84th birthday, February 21st, for those who are watching this later. Um, the quote is, slavery has never been abolished from America's way of thinking. Mm. It's so true. Um, yeah, I was watching, uh, we both watched, the Trevor Noah was on The View, and he was there promoting his book, but they got on what I think is a very important conversation on racism that is often ignored. I'm hearing more about it now as I feel people are refusing to kind of let themselves be pulled into what the normal narrative is and really want to have meaningful conversations. But he brought up a great point of what, what I thought was a mindful approach to racism. And he was talking about it needing to be classified as an illness. He talked about how um, alcohol abuse and drug abuse, it used to be you just considered a drunk and now it's considered an illness and how racism in a lot of ways is very similar. And it's something that is taught through cultures and through families and something people are brought up with. And it's something that is not just a choice someone makes as an adult. It's something that's kind of been a seed within them that has been watered and grew. And it's, mm -hmm. it's going to take more than just calling people out to kind of trigger them out of those habits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I definitely like um, what he brought up and talking about racism in that way. Um, I think part of my reaction to kind of viewing it as an illness is that with alcoholism, I think that, you know, there's this personal impact that the behavior has. I mean, you know, there's definitely impact if someone gets in a car and, and drives for other people. But with racism, a lot of the effects of racism are impact so many people and have such a broader impact. So my initial kind of hesitancy was like, well, so does that mean that people get a pass for being racist, you know, and for having those views? And that was kind of my my initial emotional response. But then I think, you know, thinking about it more, I think that it is an illness in that it's conditioned in, into someone that right. it's like you said, people don't just pop out in adulthood um, being racist. It's, it's something that's being conditioned through their environment, through family, through experiences and all of these different things. And so if we can recognize that it's much more complex than just calling somebody out and trying to challenge their belief to change their mind, then I think that we will get a lot further and have a much more mindful approach to having the conversations yeah i think the big difference in that comparison to drug abuse or alcohol abuse is the the individual nature with alcohol or drug it doesn't that illness doesn't affect institutions you right. know like racism it affects institutions and laws can be racist you can't a law can't be alcoholic you know right. um so i think that's a big difference. And what I liked, he said, let me find the quote. He said at one point, do you want to change? Do you want races to change or do you want to maintain the higher ground? And I often feel like that is kind of what what I see from not as much from activists within specific movements like Black Lives Matter. I don't see that as much, but I see that with liberal allies and the general kind yes. of liberal mentality of how they they look at racism it, mm -hmm. it it seems to be very much about maintaining the higher ground and what trevor was saying is the problem with that is exactly what we're seeing is you just lump all these people as racist into a group and just try to push them out but then there's this horrible. huge group yeah there's this huge group of people then who are together and they say, well, you're a racist and I'm a racist. We're all racist. We're all in this group. And you kind of lose the effect yes. of calling them out. Yes. Yeah. And you, you end up marginalizing 
and that, right. and I think we don't get anywhere when we marginalize anyone. And so I think we end up kind of, um, you know, I think there's there's this this idea, and people will say, oh, well, you know, liberals kind of are can be reverse racist, and I don't think that that is really um, something that I believe is valid. But I do think that we can definitely reverse marginalize people right. and kind of push them to the outskirts, and and it's like, well, you know, the the basket of deplorables that kind of that that comment that resonated so much when Hillary Clinton was running because people really felt like she was lumping everybody together into this kind of place and it was like well then we're deplorable together and let's all be over here and 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 kind of commiserate around that and so that's how we continue to have these factions and um and that's not how we actually move forward in making any change and yeah I think, and I oh, go, go ahead, ahead. I was just going to say, I, I think that, um, you know, the the difficulty with, with that is that we can't have conversations when we're pushed away from each other in that way. You know, there's no space to challenge any of those views and, 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 and kind of broaden someone's perspective who's coming from a very kind of a racist, um, white supremacist kind of viewpoint is that I really try to look at kind of the, the, the viewpoint is just extremely, extremely narrow um, when somebody's kind of coming from that space. And when somebody's coming from such a narrow viewpoint, you don't help them by um, pushing that away because it just, it doesn't allow them to expand it. Um, but I also think it's so hard to have these conversations and to, to, to find a space to be able to, um, speak about it without people getting defensive or people feeling marginalized because these are these are issues that are affecting people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis and so it, it's a huge challenge of how to mindfully discuss it because i think it's 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 so um riddled with emotion and with 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 current things going on that i just think that people's people's um responses and, and emotions make sense around it and so it's hard to kind of find a place to be mindful and actually have these conversations. Yeah, uh, what what I find hard for me is it's it's obviously a very complicated um, situation, and just there's so many layers to it that I don't know. I try to think about it productively, and and I often find myself stuck because I know I know the, the history, but I don't know the the nuances. So I don't know what is actually more productive in that I see it kind of from two ways you can kind of go at it. And I, and I think the solution is obviously a, a combination of the two, but one is there's this idea that we end racism through legislation. So if we kind of focus on the, the government and having legislation that's fair and equal, that will kind of seep down it's kind of like trickle down economics in a way it'll kind of trickle down and trickle down have justice. an effect on the people and yeah. then there's the other kind of opposite point of view which is we really have to change minds and hearts and then that will because the government is just people once people change the government then changes with it um and it, it's i in the long term I think they go hand in hand, but in the short term, getting um, successes under our belt in a in quickly and effectively, I'm not sure which one to focus on. And I think mm -hmm. what ends up happening is there ends up being a battle between the two sides and then nothing gets done because like everything else in our country, it becomes kind of polarized. And then you're right. fighting on who has the better ideas as opposed to working together to kind of find a, a synergy yeah yeah i think i think that um i think that we've seen this happen before and we've seen when we kind of took a legislation only approach to kind of working on it i think that you know the civil rights movement was extremely effective in getting legislation and policy changes um for voting the voting rights act and you know there were there were lots of there was lots of of of, of changes um to the to the just you know to the system that were meant to kind of create this change but those don't those in and of themselves don't change people's hearts and minds and actually those 
if you're just looking at that, can push people who already are 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 afraid of those changes to to a further kind of polarized right. place, feeling like, well, they're doing all this stuff for everybody else, and what about me? You know, and kind of having that that struggle. And so I think it really does have to be a combination of of all of it. And I think it really has to start with having really real conversations about the impact of racism and white supremacy and kind of that this country was really founded on white supremacy and really talking about it in that way and being very honest about that um, in order to start to create some change. And I think you really spoke at a, at a brought up a good point that I see that creates resistance to this. And this is kind of this place where people, um, allies or, or, or so-called allies will kind of, rather than being willing to listen, kind of just want to take a moral high ground of like, that's not me. I'm not right. that person, you know, that's not where I'm coming from. And that is all well and good, but it actually doesn't really help move us forward. And, and those kind of conversations can actually devalue, de invalidate and delegitimize someone's experience who's kind of coming and trying to express their own struggles. And so I think we really have to kind of recognize that, you know, A, I think being an ally is not really labeling yourself an ally as much as it is actually being involved in doing the work. I think the kind of the most effective allies don't have to really call themselves allies. They just are there right. and on the ground and doing the work. And so I think that when people kind of come to, um, these movements and wanting to help out, I think you have to be willing to come to it from a place of being a beginner's mind, you know, let's bring it back to mindfulness talk of coming to it from a beginner's mind of recognizing, even if you've never perpetrated these things or done these things, this is someone's experience and this is how it affects them. Yeah. And I think too, talking about um, allies and kind of the, the moral high ground, it's interesting because what I see is a lot of it is ego driven and yes. not in what you normally think of ego. It's not from a, a vicious self-centered place. It's from this place of um, wanting, wanting to, to feel safe and to feel like you're, you're helping yes. and from these things. So another part, another thing that was brought up during the Trevor Noah subject was, um, how so many people say they don't see color mm -hmm. and how that's a very, <laughs> that's a, heard that. it's just, <laughs> and I, it's, the, people tell me, and they, people think it's a compliment. I'm like, Oh, I don't see color. I'm like, it's not good. But then you don't like the thing, then you don't see what's going on is the right. thing. And I, I see it as a, it's a defense mechanism. It's ego. Yeah. It's, it's all those things. But if you truly feel that way, you're not being honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. If you live in America, right. like I f anyone who actually looks at it, racism is so ingrained into our, our culture and our society that everyone's affected by it. Mm -hmm. So for you to say things like, oh, I don't I don't see color and all just it, it. It seems like you're like you said, kind of disrespectful in a way to what someone else is experiencing or like you just don't get it yeah i mean it's it's not even i would say beyond disrespectful it's invalidating of right. who that person is it's like you know every time that someone has um tried to connect with me by telling me i don't see color you know it's like but my color affects me everywhere i go every experience that i have and so you telling me that you don't see it that that's invalidating and that almost means that like we are not going i'm for me that's almost a signal that i'm not going to be able to have mm -hmm. a real conversation with you about my experiences and about my life because those things that are color related you're not going to want to see and you're probably going to you know push those things away yeah, and, and it's, so that it's... so that, i think that's the challenge with that but I, I i do think it comes from a place of of not wa of wanting to not be a part of the problem you know wanting mm -hmm. to help wanting to be um above the fray of the the insidiousness of kind of the white supremacy in this country but the reality is that i don't any of none of us are above it 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 affects us whether you realize it affects you or you 
aren't paying attention to it at all, it still affects you. Yeah, and my comments about kind of it being people not understanding or just on that, with that specific statement, if you tell someone of color that you don't see color, you are admitting that you saw color because why would you say that otherwise? <laughs> you don't go around talking to white people like, I don't see color right. before you <laughs> introduce. <laughs> so clearly they saw the color so that they would think. <laughs> right. yeah. uh, so you've already given yourself a way that you're that you're approaching me differently that you're approaching someone right. of color differently by saying i don't see color just so you know i'm not a part of this problem you know yeah, yeah. the other thing that was brought up that i love and i think i've talked about before is branding and they talked about um trevor brought up this the way Amer- he was talking about the differences between South Africa and how the the racism is very blunt and in your face yeah. and how you can't you can't kind of shelter yourself from it because it's just it's everywhere yeah. where in America it's a much um, subtler version of racism currently and he was talking about um, the branding of it and specifically the kind of the 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 two major parties and how Republicans are just really great at branding and democrats tend to be terrible at it and you see it with everything you saw it with with obamacare you mm-hmm. see it with climate change um mm-hmm. when they, they originally called it global warming uh, and you're like you should have called it climate change from the beginning because you give it <laughs> it's just like these little mistakes but republicans are great at branding in a way that the racism is not blatant so he was talking about calling people low income or the mooching Walker. class yes. or all that stuff, the war on drugs, yeah. all these things that are underneath it is really a very racist kind of I ideology that's in in ways, um, I don't want to say scarier than when it's when it's blunt racism. No, but it but is, it's it's yeah, it's harder to it's harder, I think, to pinpoint and to deal with because it's subconscious it's not right there yes yeah i think uh, you're completely right on and i think that that is more dangerous um and and like you said more challenging to to deal with when it's not in your face um you know there's um there's an infographic that that gone around for a while and I actually pulled it up before this talk because I wanted to have it in my mind when we were talking and it shows overt white supremacy which is socially unacceptable and it's got like a mountain peak and it shows the few things that are kind of at the top of that peak that are very clearly um, overt white supremacy and socially unacceptable so KKK not socially acceptable that's why they wear hoods um, neo-Nazis right eh, that's getting a little kind of gray right now because now we've got this alt-right rebrand um mm-hmm. you know um specific racial slurs things like that but the things that are under the surface that affect people daily are you know um just all those other things that you talked about that are below the surface hiring discrimination um discriminatory lending you know that's a huge issue discriminatory lending police brutality um racist mascots bootstrap theory you know, boot, things like that are extremely covert, but they're they're and they're socially acceptable. And and and, um, you know, the school to prison pipeline, all of these things. And and when those things are going on, but we we can't talk about them. And those are kind of those those trigger words where they they become, again, these kind of polarized discussions. I think we're in a, a difficult place and it makes it that much more challenging because people are like well no you know we civil rights was a long time ago we're not dealing with this when there's all these systemic issues that affect people of color on a daily basis and no one wants to be honest about them and and even now you know with the new administration these things are getting worse you look at um voter rights and voter id laws and things in different countries and or sorry (laughs) different states and the issues of voter suppression and just with the 2016 election and there are more attempts to suppress even more voters but we can't talk about that because you know openly because it's it's not um it's not as obvious as the other Mm -hmm. things that we've seen in the past well i think too it takes more it takes more 
I don't want to say intellect, but more understanding mm -hmm. to see it for what it is because the, when it's in your face type of racism, you don't get the, the counter argument, the counter racism, where now you're having a lot of white people saying, well, we, there's racism against us too. You don't get that when it's like, you only get that when it's subtle because it's people who aren't seeing that subtlety. So they're just seeing, it's, it's the whole quote of when you're in power, um, equality feels like suppression type type thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that is what you're kind of seeing is, as yes. people are standing up for true equality because it's now subtle, it makes the other group feel like they're being attacked yes. as opposed to um, on equal grounds. Yes, yeah. And I think that also um, kind of comes from people's perspective. When you're in a position in society, your perspective is much different if you, um, depending on how much discrimination you experience. And so I was talking with a friend of mine about race and um, we were, she, she mentioned that it's kind of like sitting on a bus where, you know, the drivers in the front of the bus, they don't see everything going on behind them. They just see the road and what's ahead. So this is like, you know, white man in America. He doesn't really see all of the things that are going on behind him because it doesn't really affect him. But the further you get, back on that bus and, you know, referencing back to the Montgomery bus boycott, going all the way back to having to sit at the back of the bus, you see everything. And so you see how you're marginalized, you see how the person in front of you is marginalized and everyone, and you see the benefit to the person that's driving, but you don't have the ability to kind of change those things, but you have a broader perspective. And so I do think that people who are conditioned with a certain amount of privilege that they're completely not aware of, genuinely do have a deficit in their ability to see a broader kind of perspective in things and there has to be more it's much more challenging to kind of get through that because they haven't had to 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 have that experience and to look at things from that way so i thought that was really interesting and it it helps me to kind of understand some of the challenges when people are really really wedded to their their white supremacist beliefs. Yeah, and there was a great article I actually posted on Twitter today. So anyone who wants to read it, it's just a, it's it's a great article, and it's talking about why people moving to the cities tends to make them more liberal. So it kind of breaks mm -hmm. down um, kind of life experiences mm -hmm. that lead to people being liberal versus conservative mm -hmm. and it's not i don't it's not a biased article it literally just says like this life experience tends to make you lean towards this and this one leads to that and one of the big things is when people are in an area that's either extremely segregated or is just one group of people and it was talking about how when you're in the when you're in the city um you tend to have a more favorable viewpoint of government in general because you can mm -hmm see the things the government are doing there's public transportation you're seeing clean water you're seeing you're seeing the government actually being involved in your life where if you're in the country you don't see it as much it was talking about how when you're in a city your neighbors are multicultural when you're in um even a, a suburb or uh or the country yeah you may see diversity but they tend not to be your neighbors. You're going somewhere and they're the other who are occupying the space with you. Yeah. Um, and just the the difference is there. So and trying to bring it back to a how to be my how to engage mindfully with with racism. I think the best way to, to do it is not to get into those same arguments of calling your loved ones racist or or whatever it is, those, I mean, you see it all the time, right, but right. to actually engage in a meaningful way of letting them know what's important to you, but don't, don't judge them and give them the experience because people tend not to change, change, to change their mind until an experience forces them to. So taking that, if you, if you have, if you're white and you have racist family members and you have black friends or Muslim friends or whoever it is, have them engage with those people, take them to a multicultural church or whatever, whatever it is so that they actually have the experiences that are beyond the very limited experiences they've had. And I think too, 
going to do things with with them like i'm not saying go to like some neo-nazi retreat but actually engaging with them in a meaningful way of things that matter to them can help you understand them better it doesn't mean it's going to change your mind necessarily but you're at least giving them an opportunity to experience something new and you're having a new experience to understand them better yeah yeah i think i think you're right it, it really goes back to giving space to have individual connection about these things and allowing people to have an experience for themselves rather than being told what they should do or what they should feel i think as human beings we're we're very um resistant to being told what to feel or what to think or, or what to do and so i think anytime you know we come at someone with that's wrong your view is wrong we're going to meet resistance and so we have to find a way to rather than judge try to give this person another experience um, and another perspective and i also think um you know again going back to allies you know this is a space where allies can really really be effective um in bringing their own family and and, and bringing their loved ones to these spaces and 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 kind of being a bridge um for the people who are 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 being oppressed and kind of that other side that is that is doing the oppression yeah i think a big problem too with just politics and just the way people engage in general is when people have walls up and their defenses up they their critical thinking goes out the window mm -hmm. they basically just shut down and we kind of live in that state most of the time now it seems speci specifically politically yeah. your walls just come up and there's nothing that's going to change your mind because your your walls are up and that's how we're mm -hmm. built to do where you're in survival mode and that's it where if we actually want to change hearts and minds we have to get those walls to come down first right. um so that should be the focus mm -hmm. um and in, in your in your personal lives, if you're getting heat and your walls are up, find a way for them to come down where and when they are down. The interesting thing is most of the time I find people agree with me. You know, most of it was miscommunication or not truly understanding what I was trying to say, getting hung up on word usage. They just mm -hmm. don't like the word racism, but they actually agree with everything you're saying. They just right. get they, their wall comes up every time you use just that word. Um, which is a, is a problem itself, but once the walls are down, then you can have the conversation of, well, when I say racism, this is what I mean. I'm not calling you, I'm not saying you're going out and, and trying to attack black people. I I'm saying this is modern racism that we need to fix. And I, as part of this culture, I'm also affected and contribute to it just yes. by contributing in the culture. It's not me versus you. We're all in it together. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really, really important piece that we don't do enough of is that like, we're in this together. It's not a blame thing. We're all a part of this culture. I, I, I participate in it. And it's, it's all it's up to all of us to kind of come up with a solution and to talk about it. I think that's the heart again, that that the difficulty is that people are leading with judgment. And when we lead with judgment, it just we don't get anywhere. And so kind of leading with connection being able to say like i get it i see this and this is what i want to do about it yeah so i want to move on to it's not really moving on because it's all interconnected but intersectionality right. which is interconnectedness um just on well what what are your feelings on i guess the the state of intersectionality and kind of it being brought to the forefront in many ways for a lot of the modern movements yeah i think well first i want to start with kind of defining intersectionality because i feel like it's something that we talk about but it, it's it's i don't know that we're 100 percent clear on what we're talking about but the term intersectionality is a theory that was coined by kimberly crenshaw in 1989 and it's basically the idea that um that there are these overlapping social justice problems like racism, sexism, xenophobia, um, heterosexism, classism, 
and they create multiple levels of social injustice for the individuals that face them. And so um, just for like a super basic example, a um, black woman is going to experience both the, um, the difficulty of a female in a certain situation, if there's sexism that's involved, and then also the discrimination of racism. And when those two things collide, what happens is a lot of there weren't really systems in place to like pay attention to that and to 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 address it. And so oftentimes people got lost. Um, a lot of times people that that meet these different co- cross sections, and you know, for someone that is maybe a black trans woman that's three different intersections of discrimination that she may face um, and social injustice that creates a completely different experience than that that can be explained by each individual um, piece. And so to kind of go into that long drawn out (laughs) definition, just I think that it's important to pay attention to that and kind of look at what we're, how we're addressing social justice and activism right now in this time where, where we're really, people are getting very, very involved. And I, I think that what I like is that though the term and the theory has been around since the late eighties, I feel like it's just kind of becoming something that people are more aware of and starting to address. Um, with the women's March, for example, there was, um, there has been since the March itself, um, kind of specific, nods to to being intersectional um, through different posts that they make and things like that and kind of trying to focus on intersectionality. So I do think that there's been much more of a push for recognition that this is a problem. But I also think that um, I worry that it's becoming more of a um, kind of social justice catchphrase rather than an actual in action um, in the moment, in the moment, yeah, in the moment, um, active thing that's actually working. Yeah, the what I, what I see for intersectionality of it, kind of since it first was the phrase was coined, where it's kind of moving is the more you look into it, the more you see that all things are connected. So a lot of it now you're hearing it was so focused on kind of the the social interconnections. And now you're hearing a lot more of, well, the social interconnections are also connected to the economic that are also connected to the, the the foreign to uh, everything is connected. And I, it, it's hard because I think it has a lot to do with our education system. Uh, But because we are taught in subjects and in categories, the way we, as a, as a country, and I think, globally a lot of ways too the way we try to fix problems are very categorically um, as opposed to actually seeing how one thing affects another that affects another that affects another Um, a good example is um politically was the the jill stein campaign and it was by it was by far the most progressive and most people who would look at it would never think it would be a real realistic kind mm-hmm. of platform. Um, and what she would always say, whether you agreed with with the platform or not, is irrelevant to this. But what she would often say is that, yes, the problem is, is we look at things, we want this to be done and this to be done and this to be done, as opposed to saying, well, if we get this done, that'll trigger this to be able to be done, which is will trigger this. And that's how she did her platform in a very inter- interconnected um way and i think that's what we're kind of seeing now in in movements and i think is where what i'm what i'm hearing kind of the the slight criticism of where the 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 women's movement's use of it um what i see as the effective way moving forward is kind of what um black lives matter has done and what um the the no dakota access pipeline have done where they have picked this is our primary cause, but we understand that it's interconnected with all these other things and we will lend our voice and support to the things that are interconnected with it. Yeah. But they're still focused on um, their main cause because it gets hard if you're trying to say, yes, everything's interconnected, but that gets overwhelming because then it's like everything you have to focus on one thing. And that's what I always say. It's great when people have different things they want to focus on because 
then everything's covered. We have enough people where everything can be covered and where we're going to make the most progress is the dialogue in between and making sure that we show up for one another as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that, um, yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs> Sorry. I lost my train of thought for a second, <laughs> but no, I think that, um, with the woman's March specifically, I mean, I think that that, that was such a huge March and it, it, it happened pretty quickly from when they organized it. And so right. I think that unfairly they're getting, a lot of flack for um, things that they really couldn't do. They really couldn't, they really haven't had time to address yet. Does that make sense? Right. Um, you know, kind of this frustration, like that was such a huge movement and so many people, over 3 million people across the globe came out to march for that. And, and, and yet, you know, fractions of the amount of people come out to march for Black Lives Matter. And 100% that is true. And a lot of that does have to do with the underlying um, issues with the country and and with these with um, you know with white supremacy at the core, but that doesn't mean that the women's march shouldn't have done what they did. And they actually you know were pretty inclusive with their platform and their partnerships. And since then, they've they I feel like they've done um, a lot to speak up for other movements and use their voice because they do have a huge platform now to speak up for others, but not to, um, co-opt anybody else's movement. Right. And so I think that some of the frustration that kind of has been directed toward that specific March actually has more to do with things that were brewing for a long time and weren't really addressed, but I, yeah, I, and I think, understand it. Okay. And I do understand, I think people feeling, um, not ready to engage in a shared space based on their experiences. I think that, you know, recognizing that there are people who have experienced some of the most profoundly traumatic things, you know, and, and life events because of, um, because of police violence, because of white supremacy. And so it is completely valid for someone wherever they're at to not be ready to, to engage um, in the movement in a shared space and to really just have to kind of stick with their own community and do the work there. Um, but that's not everybody. And so I think, you know, we have to kind of recognize that people are approaching this from different levels of experience, different levels of trauma, different levels of um, daily effects based on what's going on. And so rather than judge um, how others are engaging, just kind of figuring out how you, how, where's your space, you know, finding, finding that space where you feel like you can, connect and and create some change i think really has to be the most important thing yeah and i think another hard part about it is that the intersectionalism is so strong that it takes a lot of brain power to kind of figure it out to see where all the connections are and it's it's almost there's so many connections that it's very it's almost impossible to see every connection. So I think what a lot of time happens is movements tend to be um, idealistic in mm -hmm. their, um, and I don't want to say end game, but I, they're very, a lot of them are like Black Lives Matter, um, for an example. They're very rational in what they want done. Um, to change police culture. And that's very rational. But the movement itself is is an idealistic movement um, to end, end racism. And then there's the thing, that's the kind of overarching thing. And then there's mm -hmm. the specifics that they're doing. Mm -hmm. So then it gets challenging when you get the, the Women's March, right? And they put a platform together and something in that platform, Black Lives Matter sees as counter to theirs because of the the intersection the way it intersections so but it's like you can't there's no possible way for you to realistically account for every everything like sometimes you do have to make a choice if you want to move something forward you are going to have to make a choice that we have to move this forward before this or we have to do so it does get hard when you are trying to connect the movements because they each have their own uh, agenda of what what they're really fighting for and 
no movement wants to say, well, I'm going to take the back seat while this happens so right. that this will be easier. Mm -hmm. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. So how do we, how do we like continue to mindfully engage and, and, and have these conversations? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's twofold. I think it's, uh, really focusing on expanding your mindfulness on um, intersectionality and how things are connected and trying to have as minimum of judgments as possible so that you can continue to explore the, the deep connections between everything. But then also being truthful to yourself of what matters most to you because there it, you can't i get that so many times where people are like i want to be engaged but you know i care about i care about racism and i care about lgbt rights and i care about the environment and i care about all these things and i say everybody does you know like right. yeah. you have to you're just gonna feel overwhelmed unless you pick one and or like just focus down it doesn't have to be just one but right. until you're you're focused into knowing what you want to do and then you can actually start to do things to to contribute and make change and trust that there's enough people to go around that someone else can can focus on that it's like what we're doing here um we've just we could talk about politics and and life and all these things in so many different ways and if we were trying to just talk about it it would just be a mess but we've decided that mindfulness is kind of the lens in mm -hmm. which we want to to share our kind of our viewpoints yeah um so and that lens helps you be productive yeah yeah i like that i, I like that and i also think that it's important to find a way to challenge your own views and your own comfort level you know i think that Part of part of the difficulty um, with fully engaging in, in certain areas is that we have our own our own um, experiences or views that may get, that may create distance for us between connecting. And I think that it's really important to challenge ourselves and our own kind of place um, and our own level of privilege in order to really fully engage and try and, and, and be there as a, as a, as a supporter to actually do, um, some work, you know? So for example, I'm a black female, but I also don't experience what a lot of black females experience who are not, um, who don't have a college education. You know, that's an intersection that I don't deal with, but I know that there's a whole nother layer of, discrimination of challenges that affect someone who doesn't have a certain level of education that I have. And so how can I kind of make myself, cha you know, challenge my own views about the world based on my own experiences because of where I grew up and where I was educated versus somebody that wasn't. Um, and so I think it's just really important for us to, to like be willing to like put that mirror up and to be mindful about, um, our own place and our own experiences and how we got here in order to actually really connect with people and create some change. Right. And I think another important part for people who want to be engaged and maybe feel overwhelmed or don't know how to engage or where to engage, um, it, it all starts with showing up. Mm -hmm. And I think showing up without ego or without expectation or intent. Um, I see a lot of people who want, want to know what they can do as an action to help. I get a lot of people, a lot of white people who reach out to me about Black Lives Matter wanting to get engaged. And I always send them to the Facebook group that just shows like when events are marches yeah. and stuff. And they're like, no, like I want someone to contact so I can get like involved. And I'm always like, well, the first, that's not, that's, that's you kind of coming from an eco place. The yeah. first step is showing up because you don't know what they need, what they yeah. want and what's going to be helpful. Yeah. Um, so, and the way you make those connections is to show up and you don't show up to then 
ask them how to help. How to help. You show right. up to just be supportive and then yeah. let what they need. They will, if they need something, they will ask you. Mm-hmm. And it'll present Show itself it. through the relationship that you formed by being there and by actually experiencing the space. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point that, that, that again, it's, I think it's the, the, the challenge with ego, you know, and we all, we all have it and it gets in the way, but there's kind of this, I want to do good, but also be known that I'm doing good and, and, ha- and help and have an action and do something so that I feel like I'm doing something, but that's not necessarily where the help needs to happen. That's the, the, the issue is not that you feel icky about the fact that there's all this bad stuff going on that you can't do anything about. Like, unfortunately that's, you know, that's kind of the byproduct, Mm -hmm. but that's not, that's not the issue. And it actually kind of um, brings me back to Jesse Williams speech and I'm wearing his t-shirt. Yay. (laughs) Awesome shirt. Awesome artivist. I reference him a lot, but it reminds me of his speech when he says, the burden of the brutalized is not to comfort the bystander, you know, and it's also not to give the bystander a really great position and, and give them something to do. The bystander is there to be there for support. And so, yeah, it just kind of made me think about that. It's like, that's not um, that when you're going into it with that mind frame, then you're already not connecting. So, yeah. Yes. And connecting is important because <laughs> it's that's where the change happens that's yeah where we actually that's where we actually get somewhere is when we connect so keep that in mind <laughs> yes is there anything else you would like to add no that was a lot I, I i feel good about this one i was like excited about it but this is such a big topic and so i was just kind of like worried i wasn't going to say everything and of course you can never say everything and so but no i feel feel good like we, yeah. we covered a lot so yeah and if any of our viewers or listeners have any comments or anything they would like us to dive into further on any of these topics please comment on facebook or shoot us a tweet or an email um, we would love to hear from you yes definitely yes and you could follow us on twitter at civil d tv all right have a good one Thanks, guys. Have a good one.